are you, what you are as a human being in relation to God who made you and who sustains you and who gives you breath day by day? Or are you the mere product of chance in a meaningless world? That is one of the central issues in the intellectual battles of our day. What I would encourage you to watch for and to have in mind the questions that you will be asking yourself as you hear the speakers have to do with the central meaning of humanity itself. And that central meaning, as Dr. West has already explained, is bound up with the fact, uh, are you what you are as a human being in relation to God who made you and who sustains you and who gives you breath day by day? Or are you the mere product of chance in a meaningless world? That is one of the central issues in the intellectual battles of our day uh, about the meaning of our own lives as well as the meaning of the world. So let's take briefly those two aspects. And it's basically the difference between are you in a universe that is personally crafted and personally ruled by a personal God, or is it ultimately of impersonal origins and that Personality, what is, whatever that is, is a, a kind of out of place product in an impersonal world with, with no personal origins. So those are the two things. And uh, part of the th thing is that then if you think that on the personal side, then if we have a personal origin and a personal God who's personally involved in ruling the world, then persons are not reducible simply to molecules. The molecules are, in a sense, in the service of you, molecules of your own body, rather than you in the service of the molecules. And it means persons are special, right? because they're special in the sight of God. They stand out from everything else in the world, however big or however small. And in terms of morality, oh, we're not... I'm not keeping up with my clicks here. In terms of morality, it means the persons are responsible to their creator. creator. The morality and moral standards make sense. There is a difference between right and wrong in human affairs. Well, suppose, on the other hand, that our origins are simply impersonal. Persons then are an accident, as this one uh, anthropologist said, and persons are uh, on the level fundamentally with everything else. There's nothing except this random processes that would make us any different. There may be features that we notice, but in the end, everything is on the level of everything else. And you might ask, to what is responsibility? What is, it's hard to give meaning to that. I mean, it's not that atheists don't, but I think they're really borrowing from Christian ideas at that point. What does responsibility mean if it's really all molecules in motion? The molecules don't feel responsible. So that goes back to this basic question then, and let's deal with the central questions at issue out of that. I've listed three of them there. The central questions of chance or God, gradual, that is gradual uh, growth of a distinctively human race out of past history by simple gradual steps without God's guidance? Or are there perhaps gaps of various kinds in the so-called tree of life, right? Is it really a tree with no gaps or, or really is it uh, with human beings that is distinct? And uh, are we slimy? Or, or, as the alternative, are we originally good and then fall away from that goodness? So, uh, if the origin of the whole universe and then of human beings as well is impersonal, what are the answers to those questions? Well, the fundamental answer on the matter of chance is, yeah, you are a matter of chance. You are an accident. And the, on the issue of origin, you are an, a, an ape, a very intelligent ape. 
that basically you're an animal alongside the other animals. And the slime, that's even more devastating, I think, because if slime is part of your nature, there's no escape. And what you are is what you are, and apart from escaping into some other form of existence entirely, you are the product of this past, which is tooth and claw. And, and, and the slime is in you <laughs> uh, as part of your innate character. Now, now take the next picture here, and that is, suppose that, and which I believe, <laughs> suppose that the origin is personal in charge of a personal God, then it means that you are, from the very beginning, related to God, in relation to God. Even if you're rebelling against him, you still cannot escape the fact that you are made in relationship to him. You are, in a fundamental way, higher than animals because you are personal, right? You have personal thoughts and you have uh, abilities to think uh, about religion and about the existence of God. You have uh, pictures of the far future that you can have in mind. You can do things that animals do not do. And also, on this really area of depression versus hope, if you were originally made good back in the beginning days of the human race, Adam and Eve, the Bible says, you can read it in Genesis 2, were created, and they were created in relationship to God. They did not have the tendencies to rebellion and selfishness and murder. Murder happens after the fall very quickly. They did not have those things in them. But then they fell away from that original condition. But if, if the original condition was actually good, then it means that what you are now is not, it's not built into your very nature. The rebellion and sin and selfishness that characterize human beings today. There is the possibility of escape, and the Bible, if you read it, tells you the story of not only the possibility, but the actuality of what God has done to bring you to an escape. So it's a very different view of who you are, and frankly, a lot more hopeful <laughs> than if there is no escape from the slide because that's what you are. So let's look now at the context for doing science itself. Science is only possible if certain things are already there in the universe and in us. What things? Well, at a very general and fundamental level, you have to have three things. You have to have a world that can be explored. The existence of the world, we're not going to focus on that, but it's really a mystery. How did the world come to be? And you've probably heard about the Big Bang, and, but, but that's an embarrassment, actually, for atheists and for people who want to think that matter is ultimate, because matter is not ultimate. It wasn't always here. How did it come to be, and how did it come to be with the complexity that we see around us? And then the second thing you have to have is laws. E is equal to mc squared. Well, that's just one. Right? But there are all kinds of laws of science that scientists have discovered that express the regularities of the world. If the world were pure chaos, science would be impossible. There would be nothing, really, to generalize about, no laws to discover. But the world has enormous number of complicated and fascinating regularities to it. The very existence of a species, for instance, in biology is a regularity. Right? You can classify the animals. It's not just random. And finally, you have to have people. <laughs> you have to have people who can think about the world and who can themselves creatively come up with formulas and uh, expressions, linguistic expressions of regularities that correspond to the things that they are observing in the world. Now, you can't have science 
if you don't have all three of those. Now, part of the problem is right there. And Darwin, somewhat to his credit, realized that this was a problem. This is a quote, admittedly from a private letter, so, so not so well known during his lifetime. He says, but then with me, the horror doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? In other words, if my mind has just come about randomly, there's no guarantee that it's in harmony in a fundamental way with the world out there. And this has the potential, of course, for undermining Darwin's entire theory. Maybe I'm wrong because I can't trust my own mind. That's what he's saying. <laughs> right? So there is a very deep problem in the very understanding of science once you go the way that Darwin, early in his life, went in producing his theory, but not just as a theory, but then a theory that eliminated God. So let me put it, expand that thought a little bit more with the, uh, try to unpack why Darwin felt this way. Unguided Darwinism, and there are people who think that God used gra gradual evolutionary processes. Unguided Darwinism chooses fitness, right? It's survival of the fitness, not survival of the people who know what is true. So it picks out, allegedly, if you follow the theory, it picks out for the next generation the fittest animals. There's no guarantee that fitness to survive will actually have anything to do with the truth. It just is fitness. And it also means that beliefs, whatever they are, don't really cause anything. The causes are at the level of the molecules and the chemistry and the material processes. So the beliefs may be anything you want as long as they're not governing what happens on the molecular level. So again, that detaches whatever beliefs may be and the material have trouble accounting for the mental element because for them it's all based on the motions of molecules. But it means that the, the, there's no guarantee that your beliefs may have correspondence to the world and that survival is another way of putting it. Survival depends on neurons firing at the proper sequence and times and in places within your anatomy and not on your beliefs and not on the truth. So there's no guarantee on this basis that anything that is in your mind corresponds to the world. Well, that's very counterintuitive. <laughs> we, we intuitively know better, but, but some of these people who are taking with utmost seriousness the logical consequences of materialism are saying that whole thing is an illusion. You think you think what you do because it's true. But there's no guarantee. Of course, you can reply to those people, your materialism is what you think to be true. And it has no guarantee either. It undermines knowledge completely. Now, there's people who have seen this and actually developed arguments at a very professional level. Alvin Plantinga has a, bull, a whole book where the conflict really lies, science, religion, and naturalism. And his thesis is that although superficially many people today, because of the way the media talk about it, they think the real conflict is between science and religion. <clears throat> the actual conflict is between science and naturalism. In other words, the belief that nature is all there is, and that minds are an accident. See? Because on a naturalistic basis, you can't guarantee any, any science. Naturalism actually fights against the establishment of truth. So you take a look at the book if you, you uh, want a full development of that. I'm just passing over it shortly. But contrast all of this 
with the various views um, of how the world and the law and the persons relate, right? We've seen this, but if you're a philosophical materialist, if you say all that is is matter and somehow various other things are built on top of that, persons don't matter, persons don't make sense. But what about the laws like Newton's law or E is equal to MC squared, so on? Those are actually conceptual. The laws are not material. So philosophical materialism actually has a lot of problems and ends up having a world but no law and no persons. You can't do science except by borrowing. And some of my mentors have taught me about the fact that, that a lot of the Western world is still borrowing from elements of the Christian faith. They've abandoned Christianity as a whole belief system and as a whole commitment of one's life because it's more than just beliefs. They've abandoned that, but they're still living on it. Right? They're living on the assumptions, which are convenient assumptions, in order to do science, in order to believe your mind is real and that kind of thing. But it's, it's, uh, it's running out because it doesn't any longer have a good basis if you just think that it's matter and nothing else. Well, there's another view, just to show you how these things work. Polytheism, which may be in some ways coming back. There are people who are very interested in the spiritual world. Polytheism affirms the existence of persons and affirms the existence of the world, but the gods or spirits out there are potentially in conflict. And in Greek polytheism, you may know, there's fights between the gods because they have purposes at, in conflict with one another. So there's no guarantee to the stability of the world. You can't do science well in a situation like that. There are Greeks who did it anyway in spite of <laughs> their polytheism or because they wanted to move beyond it. Now, if those systems won't work, what does work? What does work? is what we people in the West already know but are trying to forget as fast as possible. Namely, that there are these things, all three things, come by design. There is a designer. He's called God. And he crafts the world. He creates it. And he specifies the laws by speech. Let there be light. In Genesis 1, 3. And he creates human beings. And not only does he create human beings, he creates human beings in his image so that they are in tune without being God themselves. They are in tune naturally with the mind of the one whose image they are. Now you see, the early scientists, people like Galileo, people like Cap Isaac Newton, they were actually operating and sometimes self-consciously operating with a conviction we can explore and we have hope of actually understanding how God is ruling the world because we're made like him. Now that is, of course, disappeared out of the minds of many scientists and out of the minds of many people in our culture. But again, we're living on it, <laughs> right? Even the atheists are living on it when they do coherent science. So here's, here's a summary of this kind of, oh, and, and look, the, because there is one God who made all three of these arenas, they are coherently related to one another. That's why, in general terms, you're not God, so you can make mistakes. But in general terms, your mind is in tune with the world. You know, and that, we take that for granted. Everybody intuitively even knows that, except that some of the philosophers, right, who, who are drawing the logical consequences of bad beliefs. So science makes sense. In fact, science is endorsed, if we had time, we could go through it already in Genesis, in the dominion that is given to human beings over the world. And so... So they, we have the capability, and we still have it. We've inherited it. 
from Adam and Eve and from God who makes each of us in our mother's womb. So here's, here's a summary testimony of all this. It comes from the Bible, from the book of Romans. And it says, for what can be known about God is plain to them. To who? To every human being. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature. Well, who can make the universe? Only somebody who is, who is a, whose life is bigger than the universe, he's eternal, and whose power is supreme. He's eternal power, and his divine nature, namely he's God, everything about God, have been clearly perceived. Look at that, I've underlined it. Clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now, somebody's going to, Scratch our heads at this. Although if you look at people throughout the world, there are many testimonies to continuing religious impulse, to, to people feeling there is some transcendent thing or person or substance, something out there that must account for this. But it's confused. This is saying it's not confused. It's clear. It's absolutely clear. It is clearly perceived. It is not only clear out there, but it is perceived by the viewer. And you see, that's falsified by every atheist, right? By every agnostic. And this clear perception is in the things he has made. And they're without excuse. They know it. How do you reconcile that with what you actually observe when you enter people interview people out in the street. Well, this same passage, I've concealed for you the opening lines of this passage. This same passage tells you why. And here's the verse. These people suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. The problem, friends, is here. It's not there. Out in the world that the world is somehow confused message. It's here. Because from Adam onwards, the story is there in the Bible, you can read it. From Adam onwards, we have been corrupt. We have been unrighteous. I include myself. I'm not what Adam was. Now there's, there's hope, and I'm going to mention that, but we have to face the problem first. The problem is that people know about this God because he's clearly revealed in the world and the things he's made. And in scientific law, I believe, you read my book, Redeeming Science, on that, clearly revealed. Well, what happens is that they suppress the truth. They hold it down. They push it down. They tell stories to themselves to avoid confronting not only this God, but their own guilt because we've not been thankful, right? And you, you heard this story of Darwin seeing these beautiful things in the world and being overwhelmed. But the temptation, you see, of the fallen human heart, the sinful human heart, is to avoid the pain and the terror of realizing that there is a God and that you offended him. You've insulted him because you're living for yourself and not for him. Thomas Nagel, who realizes that unguided evolution has lots of problems, he's an atheist. And he, he, he criticizes many things about the theory of evolution, including the lack of a theory of mind. But in his book, he says, I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the world to be that way. Well, that's at least honest. <laughs> Because he wants to rule his own life. Yeah, I feel that same impulse in me. God has redeemed me, but he hasn't cleared out every last inch of that rebellious impulse. So that's what's happening, right? And, and as you go through this conference, I want you to look at the impressive ways in which God is 
showing his everlasting power and deity, even in the minute things, some of them very technical, that will be discussed by some of our speakers. But also to ask yourself, do you see it? It's there. Do you see it? And why don't other people see it? Right, but I'm already giving you an answer. It's there in the Bible. I didn't invent it. <laughs> so there it is. Now, let's go on. I got to look at my time and be careful here. Let's go on to talk about one key testimony that's out in the world about the existence of this Creator God in His majesty and glory and wonder and, and being completely good and the standard for morality, all kinds of things that are in the testimony that's in the world. But one key element in this testimony, believe it or not, is you as a human being. Now let me show you why. And this is from the Bible again, this time from Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In other words, I'm making a special species, a special group of individual living things that is not like anything else, either plant or animal, in certain, this certain way. Namely, that it's going to be image of God, likeness of God. These creatures are going to be like God Himself. Now, they're still creatures. But you, friend, are like God. You are a picture on a created level of God Himself in a way even that not the prettiest orchid or the most impressive galaxy in the universe is not because you are the image of God. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And again, the special character of human beings, but the special character is not something that is slapped on them in some meaningless way. The special dominion corresponds to the special nature of human beings. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The very next verse then reinforces this same message. Now look, what did, what, how do we work this out? Very simple and elementary way. Images, that language in the Bible, and the particular Hebrew word, can be used to mean pictures, either two-dimensional pictures on a wall or three-dimensional pictures, essentially statues. Now, most of these things are not moving around, right? They didn't have video. So, but they're three-dimensional, two-dimensional pictures. And what you're saying, what God is saying, because it's God speaking here, what God is saying is that you and all the other human beings are pictures of God. In fact, you're moving, moving pictures. Now, your pictures who are image of the, of the eternal God who is creator. You are, you are not creator, you are creature. But nevertheless, you are a window. You are a representation of the very character of God. That is mind-blowing if you think about it. Right? You never knew, right? Or you sort of knew, but you forgot how great a being you are, except there's just the continuing story tells us how, how you mecked it, messed it up, right? If you have something really great, if you have the Mona Lisa, if you have the most magnificent painting in the world and somebody comes along and tears at the canvas and, and defaces it, that's worse than just throwing a banana peel in the garbage. To deface what you are as the image of God is enormously insulting and serious and an ugly thing as well. So the, the whole story is not on how great you are, right? It's also on how bad you are. And I'm including myself. So the images of the picture, human beings are pictures of God, 
And you can see this worked out because they're given dominion. Well, what does that echo about what we know about God? God is the original one who has dominion. He is the king over the universe. And human beings are given a subordinate dominion, which is not infinite, which is in its own way limited, but still genuine. Your dominion, even if it's over the garden you're making, right? Or re-hanging a picture on the wall after it's fallen down. It's dominion. You are a picture of God and his dominion. That's one thing. It's right there. It's right there in the passage that we're just looking at. And then, do I have it on there? Be fruitful and multiply. What is that? Well, have children. The children, friends, the children are other human beings. They're in the image of God. And it said when Adam fathered Seth, that Seth was in the image of Adam. So you're imitating God. Multiply. Well, what did God do? He didn't multiply himself, but he made the earth entirely fruitful place, right? Where, where he multiplied you know, the display of his goodness in so many things in the created world. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to imitate that. Be fruitful and multiply. And then, what else? Well, lots of things. And now I'm going to speed up. But let's just take a few of them. Once you start thinking about yourself and how you are, you are displaying, I mean this, you are displaying who God is well, on a creature that ever. What else? Well, one of the things is that we can stand back. Now, I got the slide here going here. Yeah, we can stand back and look at the world in a way that is so far as we can see animals don't do. You can reflect on its beauty. You can imagine the far future. You can reflect on your very own existence. To do that is the foundation, one of the foundations of science. Scientific investigation includes this reflective element where we stand back from a mere immersion in the world. We start asking, how is things happening the way they are? And why are they happening the way they are? We ask these curious questions that go beyond the level of immediate uh, embedded in the world. But you see, what you're doing, in a way, is to transcend the world. You're sitting up there and imagining that you were God looking down. Now, you're not God. <laughs> but the fact that you can imagine what it would be like for God to look down on the world and to plan things, and that's what these early scientists were doing, too. What it would be like if I were God, and how would I work it, and how, what do I see happening in the world, and how does that make sense? And can I infer what God is thinking in his own mind? Well, they tried to do it. And you do it any time you stand back from life and your immersion right in the every day. Scientific investigation. Stand back and look at yourself. And this I call a kind of mini transcendence. Now, it's not the transcendence of God. God transcends the whole world. He alone is the infinite God. But you, in a sense in your own way, transcend the world by being able to look down on it conceptually. So you are displaying the nature of God. All right, and what, what that involves essentially is that God views and knows the whole world comprehensively and that you are imitating him anytime you view and know the world. Now, let's go and do, this is going to be whirlwind tour now, other features uh, reflecting God. And we've got a few that we've already mentioned, the dominion, and the verse numbers are verses in Genesis, right? So these are all re re relevant to the passage about the image of God. Dominion, fruitfulness, we mentioned that, and, and rationality, right? We haven't mentioned that so, so much directly. But it's certainly there and a necessity for science. Moral goodness, it's an implication of one of the things, but Adam and Eve are created in fellowship with God, who is infinitely good. Speaking and naming, Adam names the, gives names to the animals. That's a function of language, and the complexity of human language imitates the complexity of divine speech. 
It's not like what the animals do. I know they make grunts and groans and have calls and so on. Nothing approaching the complexity of human language. And work and rest. Adam, you know, well, you don't see it directly until later on, but God works six days, and I think they're God's work days, and it's another context to talk, well, how long are they in terms of uh, clock time, calendar time? But they, he worked six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. That becomes the pattern for human work and rest, right? And we still have it in Western culture. It's, again, one of these things with remnant of Christianity, right, that, that we have a weekend. <laughs> uh, so we're still on that pattern somewhat, although, you know, people are doing it in their own selfish ways nowadays. And uh, we have the ability to have personal relationship to God, to have intimacy with him, to understand religion and what it means to be in the presence of an infinite God. You have that capability. And that, too, is reflecting God's own inter, uh, intimacy with himself. And you go on to do a large number of things here. Uh, uh, human love, well, God is the original lover. Human planning, God is the original planner. Uh, a free agency, that is, that you make decisions and carry them out with, a, with an, uh, a certain human freedom. Well, God is the original free agent. Uh, ownership, God owns the whole world. You can own things subordinately. Uh, God, is, God is infinitely holy. You're called to be holy. You may not realize it, but that's to be part of your uh, life. Uh, harmony, there's original harmony in God himself and all his thoughts. And there's, uh, the Bible teaches that God is not only one God, but three persons, and there's harmony between the persons. Well, that's the, the pattern for the harmony that we're supposed to have as a human race. And life itself. Right? The, the, very, the, the very life that we have, it's a living God who made everything. <laughs> it's God who's alive. And we're imitating any time you're alive. You may, you know, if you're in rebellion with God, you may not like it, but any time you're alive, you're already imitating God, despite yourself. So, yeah, okay, so there's a whole bunch. Uh, and more and more, right? So I just flipped through these th things. Uh, uh, unity, each one of you is a unit, uh, an individual. God is one God. And you rise above, we talked about some of this, rising above some of the limitations of time and space. Well, God is completely above that. But you can imagine what it would, the universe would look like if you were, you were on the other side of the Andromeda galaxy. I don't think animals are doing that. <laughs> right? You can rise above their limitations, in your thought at least, and, and your ability to give to others, your creativity. Now, we got imitations of some of these things on the animal realm. But human beings, they're just on a qualitatively different level. So we have creativity. Well, God is the original creator. And we have, well, that's the creative part. It's hard for me to see my own slides here. And, uh, and we're going to live forever into the future. Now, God lives forever into the past. You had an origin in the past, but you are going to live together in the future. And by, by the way, this, according to the Bible's teaching, this includes people who don't believe in God, except their future, well, I'll talk about that in one of my sessions. Their future is still there, but it's going to be different from the future of people who are reconciled to God within this life. More responsibility, very hard to account for that kind of thing without having God as the final reference point. In the end, I would say not possible. Everybody is borrowing, really, from the conceptions of the true God and the, the reality of the true God at that point, and appreciating beauty. You know, that, again, Darwin is, I'm, I'm building on John West and his quote, because Darwin experienced this, and there's, you can't account for it. It just seems excessive. Why do we need beauty for mere fitness and survival? But the world has got many beautiful things even in it, even though in a fallen world, there are also ugly things, too. All right, so my concluding observation 
is to say, you are evidence, not only for the existence of God, but a picture of who God is. And you can't escape it, even though you may try. But the other side of it is, you are also guilty, and I am. Because though we are imitators of God in the ways that I've set forth, there's also the reality that we make ourselves to be God. We cover up, we suppress the reality of God by saying, I am my own master. And so you're guilty. Well, <clears throat> we can't get into it, but if you read the Bible, you will find that God himself knows about all this. He's perfectly aware of it all, and he's given a remedy. And the remedy is not a system. The remedy is a person. It is God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, who came into the world, took on human nature. He was God from the beginning. And this is all in the Bible. He was God from the beginning. He took on human nature and substituted for us and took the penalty for the alienation which was in us in order that we might be reconciled to him. Now, that's for another day to get into the details of that. But what I'm saying is that the, the, the very nature of who you are as humanity is related to all the way through what the Bible is teaching. Now, we're out of time. But, but you can go through in the life of Jesus Christ and you can see in Jesus Christ the per perfect and restored form of all these features that we've been talking about, of love, of planning, of free agency, and so on. Thank you. Thank you.